Well, today I've been at Porsche um, giving a talk uh, centered around Formula One and Formula E. Uh, of course, Porsche, uh, one of the new entrants to Formula E for next season. Um, but today he's been talking mostly about Formula One and about how Formula One teams uh, use their kind of attention to detail, particularly at McLaren, their level of attention to detail to become successful. But it's Monday, that means it's Q&A Monday. Ask Elvis, you guys have sent in your questions as ever. Roll the sting. Uh, barbecue, please. Thanks very much. Oh, the glamour. <laughs> okay, the car's now driving itself, which is great. Um, so let's start with this question, which came in from Will, and he says, what was the most, and this comes off the back, of course, of Max Verstappen and, and Esteban Ocon's little tussle uh, last week. He said, what uh, was the most controversial backmarker issue uh, you can remember from your time in F1? Well, I thought about it for a couple of minutes, and of course, there's one glaring backmarker uh, controversy. And that, of course, was in 2008 in Singapore, when uh, Nelson Piquet Jr., was asked by his team to deliberately crash the car to allow Fernando Alonso, his teammate, to benefit from the resulting safety car to take the win. I mean, can you think of anything more controversial than that? It blew my mind when it happened. It blew everybody's mind in Formula One when the details of that came out uh, around about a, a year later. Um, I mean, that's still to this day I find staggering. Paul Gardner asks this one. He says, Hi Mark, if a car can get into a, a slipstream, get a tow from a car in front to help them catch up, then why is not being able to follow such an issue? It seems to me contradictive. Help me understand it. Is it to do with the vortices from the front wing? Um, okay, well look, I, I know that lots of people don't get this particularly because they've asked me similar type questions. It's very easy to look at it and say, Places like Monza and Baku, where the slipstream, getting in somebody's slipstream, was actually such an advantage because it drags you along down the long straights, increasing your top speed and allows you a sort of slingshot to get by. So, in that sense, it seems like a great thing, doesn't it, that you can follow and chase a car uh, closely from behind. The problem comes when you're following a car through a series of twists and turns. And that's when you lose all downforce from your, your car, the chasing car, because of the turbulent wake coming off the car in front. Um, Formula One cars are designed in wind tunnels, they're designed with a free stream of air flowing over the aerodynamic surfaces. That's how they are most efficient, that's how they work west, best. It is, only, it is the only way you can design a car, of course, because you can't predict turbulent wake from another car you can't factor that into your design very easily because it's always different it's always coming at different angles at different speeds uh, different wakes coming off different cars different tracks different tires uh, all sorts of different factors so the only constant the only way to design your car is using free stream air in a wind tunnel the problem of course is that that free stream air that your car has been designed within to work efficiently once that's upset, once that's no longer there, and you've just got a turbulent mess uh, coming off the car in front of you, well all of a sudden your highly efficient aerodynamic surfaces are no longer highly efficient. Essentially they don't work anymore. And that means you lose a huge amount of downforce, you lose a huge amount of, of airflow control uh, that your front wing on your car would normally give you. And a consequence of all of that is that the car starts to slide around it loses grip. Sliding around with no grip means you chew through tyres, you overheat tyres, you wear them out very, very quickly. And the whole thing then means you start to lose pace and you drop behind and you're never in a position again to be close enough to try and attack and, and make an overtake work. So in a perfectly straight line, when you're following another car along a straight, yes, you want to be tucked in nicely behind it because the void, the, the 
aerodynamic void uh, that sits right directly behind the, the sort of leading car means that actually there is less air resistance to pass through and your car can be sort of sucked along in the, uh, the spinning vortices that are coming off the rear wing of the car in front that come up, loop over and sort of tuck back under that draft, that down draft pulling along the straight actually pulls your car, your chasing car faster down the straight than it otherwise would. It's when you get to the twisty bits, that's when you have a real serious problem. Uh, right, <coughs> what's up guys, back home again now. Um, got to rattle through this because it's bloody freezing out here. Um, right, a few more questions. I just want to pick up on that last one about the uh, being towed down the straight. I thought of an analogy um, which might help describe what I'm talking about. If you think about when a car on the road drives down on a lovely autumn day like it is today, drives down the road past you and you're on the sidewalk on the, on the, on the street uh, walking along, you see all the leaves that are on the pavement or around the side of the car just swirl around behind the car and get dragged off behind that car down the street. Well, that's kind of the effect that the tow has uh, when you're a, follow a Formula One car following another one. The, uh, the sort of uh, the back wash or the wash coming off the back of the car in front curls up and over and swoops around behind it, dragging everything along in the wake of that leading car. And that's what gives you that tow and that extra speed boost going down the straight. Anyway, I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not, but it just popped into my head <laughs> on the way home. Uh, so I thought I'd mention it. Right, a couple more questions. Um, Alan Murphy says, uh, I noticed during the Brazilian Grand Prix that the end plates of the Red Bull Racing front wings were vibrating a lot. Is this normal and or allowed? I thought the wings were not allowed to flex. Um, good point, I noticed it too, and I think lots of you did. Uh, there was an onboard camera position on the Red Bull in the Brazilian Grand Prix, which really just caught the edge of uh, the strakes on the front wing, didn't it? And it showed them flexing an awful lot under load. Um, raises the question, is that not considered as a, as a movable aerodynamic device? Well, the, the reality is that the FIA have restrictions that say that most, you know, aerodynamic surfaces are not allowed to be movable, but they are allowed to flex to a certain extent. The fact is that all, all components that have to be subjected to some kind of load uh, on the car have to flex to some extent, otherwise they just break when that load was applied. So they're allowed some flex. The FIA have certain tests to check that the flexing is all within their defined tolerances, but they can't check every single flick up and flap um, because they'd have to design a bespoke test for every individual piece. So they have certain tests. They have tests for the, the bib section of the car, sort of push up with a hydraulic, uh, hydraulic ram that pushes up underneath from underneath the car and they measure the position of the bib or the, uh, the tea tray area of the car and it's not allowed to move more than the, certain, you know, the tolerance that they deem acceptable uh, under certain loads. The same with the front wing. Uh, same with uh, parts of the floor as well. So there are lots of elements of the car that have specific tests for them, but those particular pieces, just little strakes that may be there one week, maybe the next week they won't be there, you can't come up with a test for every single one of those pieces. So I guess in that sense, uh, that's where the teams will always learn and try to push the boundaries as much as they can. Of course, a flexible aerodynamic device uh, under load, if it flexes to follow the line of the airflow, actually reduces some of the drag going along, along the, 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 the straight at high speed when you really want to dump the drag. You slow down, that part flexes back again, the load is, is then applied to it, it gives a greater aerodynamic effect, increases downforce or whatever it's designed to do. So that's why they do it and uh, as long as there is no specific test for that particular component they will always do it. <laughs> Uh, Abel Oi asks this one, he says, I think this may have been asked before, but will McLaren finally be able to use their own wind tunnel in 2019 now that the outwash or the outward airflow will be reduced? So you're talking about the outwash coming off the front wing, which is going to be limited by the design of next year's new front wings. And if you remember, I did a video uh, a while back about the reasons that lots of teams are not using their own wind tunnels and actually preferring to use the Toyota wind tunnel in Cologne. And a large part of that was the extreme outwash coming off the front wings and how that interferes with the walls of the wind tunnel. Uh, so it's a very valid question. Next year, the outwash potential of the front wings is going to be greatly diminished. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference to which wind tunnels people use because actually the reality is there is still going to be outwash and I think people would prefer the continuity 
of using the wind tunnel that they know and trust and have been using for years, built up data, uh, rather than switch back to something that may or may not work and uh, may, or not be, may or may not be consistent with the results they've been getting over the past few years. Don't forget, teams go down a certain aerodynamic direction based on the data they've been getting and they have to have utter confidence in that data. So if they've all built up confidence in whatever wind tunnel they may be using, the chances are they're highly likely to stick with it. Matthew Butcher says, uh, do you think eSports drivers could make the switch to real racing given the right fitness training or do real racers have the skills to compete in eSports? Really interesting question and one that's quite uh, topical right now of course because we've just had the F1, F1 eSports finale uh, this weekend. Uh, won incidentally both the teams and drivers championship won hands down with a race to spare by who do you think? Mercedes. <laughs> Mercedes, uh, Mercedes eSports team won the team's championship uh, and their driver Brendan Lee won the, uh, the driver's title as well. Um, so not only dominating real world Formula One but also virtual Formula One too. Uh, well done to all of them. Um, can those drivers take uh, what they've learned from the sim and into the real world? Absolutely they can. Uh, in fact we've seen it haven't we? We've seen Nissan have been running a program for quite a few years now uh, whereby they have taken uh, gamers and then esports uh, competitors and the best of those have given an opportunity in the real world in one of their Nissan sports car programs. Um, there have been a couple of drivers who've progressed through that system and are now doing very very well. So yes uh, absolutely that's possible to go that way. In terms of going the other way well actually most uh, Formula One drivers are pretty adept on a simulator. You know, they use simulators, uh, you know, a lot in part of their daily business um, in, in terms of learning tracks, in terms of understanding the car, in terms of working with the team on, on setup. So lots of real life racing drivers, if you want to call them that, are already very, very good, very, very competent on a sim. And I think, yes, could absolutely compete on a, on a reasonable level with esports drivers. You've got to, got to realise though, if you're a professional esports champion, if you're a professional esports sim racer at the highest level, then that's what you do all day, all night. That's what you put everything into. You're an utter expert on that particular platform. And so to take somebody out of a real car, put them in a sim, yes, they may well do very well, but your chances are you'll find those guys who take that professionalism to the level that Formula One drivers take their professionalism will still come out on top. Because whatever discipline it is, if you dedicate your whole life to it, you are going to be one of the best around. And that's the way it is for both racing drivers and sim racing drivers. Uh, this one stumped me, and in fact you might be able to help me out here. This one comes from James Baldwin, so let's all collectively try and answer this one for James. Uh, hi Mark, what's the music that's played during the, the, the champagne celebrations on the podium? Uh, in F1. I always loved it but no idea why it's played. Um, it's a really good question and the truth is I don't know the answer to this. Uh, at first I thought he was talking about the new F1 theme music but he's not. He's talking about this music. We've all heard it so many times and we've become so familiar with it but where did it come from? Who chose it and why? If you've got any ideas let me know. Stephen Chan says uh, there's some rumours that Honda and Red Bull have three dyno test locations for the engine. One in Sakura in Japan, Milton Keynes and one in Austria. Merck and Ferrari have only one location, but they may have multiple dynos. Does Honda have an advantage? Well, there is no necessarily uh, direct advantage from having uh, many dynos in different locations other than you can put different teams of people in different locations without having to have them travel to one location to work on the dyno. So if that's an advantage, then yes, they have. Um, in terms of dynos, though, uh, the amount of time you can use a dyno, if you can use more time on a dyno, if you can generate more data, um, get more information, more understanding by using more dynos or using a dyno more than somebody else, then yes, there's, a, there's an advantage to be, to be had from that. What Honda have done and continue to do with different locations for their dynos, they've got different teams of people looking at different things, often at the same time. So some teams will be looking purely at engine related stuff. Others will be looking at the, the gearbox that's bolted onto the back of that engine. Others might be looking at control systems or, or uh, combustion temperatures. Or There's a whole load of things, so many things that can be learnt 
from running engines and gearboxes and systems on dynos. It's the closest thing you can get to the real thing, which we all know is, is incredibly difficult and limited to get testing mileage done on an actual racetrack. So dynos are a hugely important part. So whether they have an advantage or not depends entirely on how they're using it, how they're getting the best out of it. But just because they're in different locations isn't necessarily better than having more dynos in one particular place. It's generally the amount of time you can use them and what you can take from using them that will give you an advantage. Right, let's finish with this one. Uh, Jakob Wikowski. In 2019, with less downforce, more drag, but also more effective DRS, is it possible for F1 cars to be faster on tracks like Monza or Baku, where you need maximum speed on the straight, and be slower at other tracks? Uh, well, yes, that is absolutely possible. Um, so what we don't yet know are the absolute effects, and teams will know some of this. Their CFD will have given them a pretty decent idea of what kind of lap times they're going to generate at different tracks. I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but because we do have more drag with these cars, there is going to be potential that, that these cars are going to be slower. The FIA say they will be slower, but so lap times will be slower. In terms of absolute top speeds though, because we get the opportunity on the long straights at most of these tracks to flip open the DRS, which is now 20 millimetres bigger, giving us now, instead of a 65 millimetre gap, we've now got an 85 millimetre gap on the rear wing, we actually dump a lot more drag than we were dumping this year. Now that might mean in those situations, in a DRS assisted situation, we may well see at some tracks like Baku, a higher top speed achieved. Um, we don't yet know, is the truth. Until we get real cars on real tracks, we won't know the abs absolute answer to that. But it's a definite possibility that we might see lap times that are slower overall, but uh, cars that actually achieve a higher, a higher top speed than we may have may have seen before at some circuits. Um, so perhaps some circuits will be quicker than others. The truth is, we don't know, but let's wait and see. I can't wait to find out. And that's one of the best things about a new season. I can't believe we're almost at the end of this one and already we're talking about the beginning of next season, but what an exciting time it is. 2019, another big change. Can't wait to see what happens. Uh, thank you very much again, everybody, for all your questions. Really, really appreciate them. Keep them coming in. Let's try and help James out with answers to that question about the music. Uh, and, um, and look, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, thanks very much. Have a good evening. <laughs>